gotten some uh, some tomatoes in the ground and some uh, yeah we've got cotton going in last few days so lots lots happening right now oh cool. yeah I know sometimes if it's you have a wet spring it prevents planting on the cotton side of things wet springs in general in California are never never very good but um it hasn't been as wet as it was last year so it's not um it's not really impacting us we'd like to see a little bit warmer weather but it's uh it's not terrible and caroline if you'll kind of i can't see when the participants are joining so if people are just... trickling in yeah cool we got some people Great. on already thanks everyone who's hopping on we're gonna Give it a minute or two to get as many folks in here and ready. So we'll start here in just a minute or two. Good, I'm glad we um, figured out the, the technical side of this quickly. It was Just a gamble. In time. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we did the practice run. And for those folks just joining, we're going to wait probably another minute before we get started. We're going to try to see if we can allow a few more folks to hop on and get set. Thanks for everybody who's already on. Caroline, we're still seeing some some folks hop in. Mm -hmm. People are still trickling in, but a lot more. It's looking steady. Okay, good. Yeah, I think waiting just another minute will be good. Thanks again for everyone who's joining. <clears throat> we'll get started here in just a just a few moments. Not far off. So has it been a wet spring for you guys? Is that what what I was hearing? Uh, it hasn't been as uh, last year was quite a bit a wetter March. Really wet. uh, yeah. So actually, the field conditions are are not too bad. But we yeah, so we've been able to get a reasonable start. Um, not a perfect start for cotton, but um, for tomatoes and the watermelons and I think all the other crops are enjoying themselves right now. But um, the cotton likes pretty warm soil temperatures and then certainly likes to get some heat uh, from now for quite a while. So a little, little bit of a, a little bit of a roller coaster right here, but nothing, nothing too dramatic. Do you guys have, um, do you guys rely on any runoff from like the Sierras that gets irrigated over towards you or you guys um, like just precept? Yeah, we're pro. Oh, yeah, we're one hundred percent irrigated uh, for California. I mean, anyway, because we're one of the few Mediterranean climates, we rely on the snowpack is really kind of the main. So the water system is either from the San Joaquin River or actually uh, Lake Shasta. So um, okay, yeah, that's sort of a California is a unique in terms of cotton growing regions. There's very few that are in Mediterranean climates like ours. So we we do rely on putting the water on at the right time because we won't get we won't get much rain uh, or not certainly not enough rain to produce a cotton crop. Yeah, we're excited to jump into all this. Yeah, well, I think this, this is probably good. We wanted to make sure everyone was able to hop on here and get set. Um, just wanted to start say hello to everyone. Welcome. Um, wanted to again thank everyone for attending our continuing education forum featuring Canon Michael. Internally, our, our whole team has been thrilled to put this together and looking forward to this conversation. My name is Dave Boger. I'm one of the co-founders. I'm joined here with several team members and also by our other co-founder, Pete Drago. 
Yeah. So the reason why we wanted to have Canon on the forum is to have a conversation surrounding what it's like to run a family owned farm where cotton is one of the rotational crops. And then the second piece is just to help educate ourselves as well as our customers surrounding cotton farming. We definitely want to address some of the common myths and some misinformation around farming and also specifically cotton farming. Um, it's our belief that educating our customers as well as ourselves on what's happening right now in our industry helps them understand what choices they have and how those choices impact the environment and the people in those communities. So our industry globally still has a ton of help, needs still needs a ton of help doing just the basics, which is treating the environment well and treating the individuals harvesting and manufacturing the products fairly. So this is looking you know, from a global perspective as well. So <clears throat> this is the massive, hard to overstate, tangible value behind traceability, origin certifications, along with third parties helping verify each major step in the manufacturing process because really all this is an effort. What we're discussing is these, this traceability piece, the origin certifications, the third party organic certifications, et cetera. All this is an effort to keep um, all parties involved in the supply chain accountable from dirt to shirt. So yeah, I think we're just gonna jump into it. Uh, we want this to be conversational. Uh, Canon's gonna be able to give us more information than we could possibly consume. We're gonna do this about 30, 30 plus minutes and then leave it open for a few minutes of question, questions from anyone who's um, attending. But um, just wanna give a little bit of reference for where Cannon is calling in from today. He, his farm is located in the San Joaquin Valley in California. Uh, this is starts Northeast of LA and travels North towards San Francisco. It's roughly 250 miles from North to South. So a massive area. And the San Joaquin Valley is responsible for roughly 25% of all fruits and vegetables grown in the US. So, I mean, that's a pretty staggering statistic, right? So just to give you the scale of what's happening in this region. Um, and also this region is thought of as um, at the forefront of agricultural technologies and innovation, uh, which is just some cool stuff. And Canon will be able to share more about this as well. Uh, and then now specifically to the Bowles family farm, which is Canon's family, they grow carrots, onions, garlic, tomatoes, watermelon, cantaloupe, almonds, cilantro, basil, corn, and of course our very prized extra long staple, Sapima cotton. So a large, just a little more details on Cannon's farm is a large portion of the farm is run on solar and their family for a long time has used progressive farming methodologies and we'll let Cannon cover this. Um, however, it's gonna be very clear that the Bulls family farm has been at the forefront of stewardship and ecologically focused farming techniques for a very, very long time. So we'll hop into the Q&A portion. Cannon, if you would, would you introduce yourself, share a little about yourself and your farm? And if you would, can you highlight a few of the farming methodologies and techniques that you're currently practicing on the farm? Sure, thank you for the very nice uh, introduction and certainly appreciate everybody uh, everybody joining. And yeah, do, do wanna take questions and happy to Take anything from a hardball to a softball question. No question should be off limits. Um, so I certainly want to use the time Great. wisely. But um, yeah, so the the farm has been in the family for a long, long period of time. My third great grandfather uh, immigrated from Germany as a very young man, very little education, but um, knew how to butcher uh, cattle a little bit. So he got into uh, the cattle business here in California to supply a growing state um, at a time when uh, you know food supply was something that people needed to to figure out uh, as California kind of had a boom time uh, with the gold rush and everything else. So a lot of it was right place, right time, but he was a pretty uh, visionary uh, guy from, uh, again, not coming from very much and turned himself into a fairly su successful cattle farmer over the years. Um, but uh, the family's gone or the farm's gone through a number of iterations since that time uh, through the uh, family challenges and all kinds of different things that happen as family businesses age and change uh, sort of has become uh, Bulls Farming Company, which was an offshoot of the larger company that was started at one point. Um, but uh, now no no cattle anymore and uh, doing uh, a lot of uh, diverse products. But um, I'm the sixth generation of, of my family to be involved in the business. Uh, the original uh, first 
piece of property that my third great grandfather bought was this property here. So we've been uh, farming on the same land for over 160 years. Um, so I think uh, certainly gives us a lens of um, sustainability and um, obviously trying to figure out how to continue to continue on past six generations. But um, it does get um, does get challenging the further that you go. Um, but uh, my my journey on the farm just kind of began as a young boy coming. I grew up in the Bay Area, actually, and then would come down with my grandfather, um, but always loved the feeling of freedom and openness that the farm kind of has and um, became uh, interested and in worked my high school summers on the farm doing irrigation and kind of learning the business that way. Went off to uh, college and started doing other things than farming, um, but came back to help the family uh, due to some family illnesses that happened with some of the leadership of the farm. Um, so I've been here for for quite a while, but I took over uh, as president of the company in 2014. Uh, and since that time, really have changed our trajectory. Um, we were really growing about three crops, uh, which were alfalfa, uh, barley and cotton. Um, but we've really changed now to grow a very wide diversity that Dave mentioned uh, some of the different crops that we're growing. Um, we also have uh, started an a organic uh, program. Um, about 10 percent of the farm now is uh, certified organic. Um, so we uh, really extra, cool. yeah, extra long staple organic program and also a uh, organic tomato program. We do some other things, but those are kind of the two staples. But um, so it's been it's been interesting. Um, part of the evolution when I took over was also uh, empowering some of our uh, workforce uh, in terms of allowing them opportunities uh, to advance from within the company, which hadn't been something that we had traditionally done. Um, but now have a pretty good uh, program for employee advancement, which has also been uh, really rewarding. But um, yeah, I, I think in terms of the methodologies that we use, I, the, the philosophy that I have is essentially that, you know, we have to, we're sort of stewards over this land and kind of resources that we, that come along with some of the water supply and things like that. But um, if, if mm -hmm. the soil, if the soil we manage isn't healthy, and if the people that are helping us do the job uh, here aren't healthy, if our local environment where we farm is, is not healthy. And if our communities aren't, aren't healthy and, and if we're not taking care of that water resource, you know, this farm can't be successful. So I think that's yeah. kind of our guiding, guiding principles is kind of focusing on our stewardship uh, role that we play. Yeah. We wish, we wish lots of the big corporate farms viewed it the same way. Right. That's unfortunate. It's been such a diversion from again, what is the basics of just taking care of, the land and also the people that are involved in in planting, harvesting, and manufacturing. Um, so I, I probably interrupted a little bit. So on some of the farming methodologies, if we kind of break them down in some easy buckets, because you guys do some incredible stuff and super progressive stuff. So we we'll definitely want to try to highlight what is unique about your farm and some of these methodologies that um, is maybe different than conventional farming. Sure. And I don't think I touched on it maybe enough, but our location where we are is also very unique in terms of uh, California because we are actually adjacent to um, the what they call the Grasslands Wildlife Management Area, which is the uh, second largest contiguous wetlands in the United States. So the western boundary of our farm, and we actually also manage uh, about 650 acres of wetland habitat, um, is, is part of this really unique resource for the Pacific Flyway. Um, so our connection to the environment is also a little bit different. Um, we kind of serve uh, kind of a dual role where we actually, some of our systems of del water delivery act actually deliver water to the uh, to the refuge uh, areas as well so um and we kind of have a have a lens on on the environment that I don't think other folks do it can cause challenges because we go to a lot of food crops and so we're subject to a very rigorous food safety audits and so uh, it's kind of an interesting twist that uh, I think the consumer and people in California would want us to have what a lot of people now obviously biodiversity is a term that we hear a lot about but um, we actually are penalized for biodiversity when it comes to food safety uh, audits but um We've done a lot of uh, programs throughout the farm to uh, increase the plantings of native species, especially native plants that are beneficial to uh, pollinators. We we rely on pollinators a lot. Cotton uh, doesn't necessarily uh, have to have a lot of uh, pollination activity. Uh, we're, we've done some studies where there can be benefits, but um, we want our melon crops and some of the nut, uh, nut crops that we have um, uh, also benefit quite a bit from uh, pollinators. And so uh, having uh, our local pollinators be healthy and uh, using native plants to su uh, supply them with refuges has been really helpful. Um, 
So, and, and then in addition, you know, obviously we have the organic certified land, which is different, but um, even on the conventional uh, side of what we do, uh, California has been, uh, you know, a very uh, progressive state in terms of regulation. And so uh, there's a number of uh, products even on the conventional side um, that have been uh, either banned outright or prohibited in California, but they're still widely used in all the other cotton producing regions. Uh, they've been banned because of toxicity either to humans or to bees. Um, but uh, and again, so they're not in the not in the toolbox of the conventional California grower, but they're widely used by all of their folks in the United States as well as outside of the United States. So even underneath the conventional umbrella, I think it's important um, to understand that those kind of nuances, because I think it's um, a tendency to sometimes generalize about, um, you know, farms and, you know, conventional and some of the methodologies. Absolutely. But there's there's actually nuance between just actually where it's being where the products being grown is very important. So um, I'm happy to highlight more of that or I'll let you, you've got to watch me, Dave, because I, like I said, sure, I sure. just kind of run on and cool. on. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably dive into some of that want. too. So if we're doing the bucket, so you do conventional farming, which is what people think of when they're probably see cotton being grown in photos as conventional farming, and then you're doing organic cotton farming. And then if I remember correctly, you have some component to, um, some regenerative ag stuff that you guys, either a program that you have launched or have done in the past, are those the three big buckets primarily? Yeah, and it's been interesting. So yeah, the organic is obviously very specific because you have to be certified. Um, you know, conventional is essentially if you're using uh, synthetic uh, chemistries or tools, um, you know, so they're, they're, that's kind of that umbrella. And then regenerative is where, you know, there's been a lot of new interest. Um, I would say from our standpoint, you know, we've watched a lot of these uh, terms, you know, come up and become popular and maybe fade out or right. our philosophy, kind of what I alluded to. And I don't know if I finished the thought entirely, but really just we've had this long term lens of like, you know, again, hey, your soil's got to be healthy. Your people got to be healthy. The community around you has got to be healthy. The environment around you has got to be healthy. And then that makes a successful farm. Um, so our investments have been in that direction for a very long period of time, but that has led us to things like planting cover crops where it makes sense to using natural mm -hmm. inputs like manures and composts, um, you know, to having great programs for our employees to, um, you know, having our own agronomist on staff, um, you know, to all these different things, you know, to, we work with a local Basque family who comes in and brings animals in, they've done it for decades, uh, sheep and goats. Um, to do animal grazing. So a lot of the components and, and we've been reducing inputs um, all the time because California is such an expensive place to do business. You know, we've really been focused on just using the right amount of, uh, you know, fertilizer or, you know, our agronomist goes out every single day and sweeps the fields to try to help us not put on a chemical to hopefully balance the beneficial insects against the predatory insects so that we don't have to intervene if our natural population of beneficial insects, ladybugs and lacewings, if they're taking care of the of the pests, yeah, sure. then, yeah. then we don't have to we don't have to intervene and it's a much better system. So all those things are kind of components about what people are circling around on in terms of uh, regenerative. So I feel like I kind of say we were doing regenerative before it was cool. And sure, uh, sure. we'll be doing the right thing, I think, for long after if, if regenerative stays around, that's great. Um, We've worked on um, Fiber Shed as an NGO that we've worked with on some very kind of specific uh, um, regenerative things. I think it's important to remember that California is one of the few Mediterranean climates that grows cotton. Um, so a lot of the regenerative ideas are coming out of rain-fed monoculture areas. And those programs are going to look very different than what we do here in California. So I think contextually, you need to be careful about regenerative because it, it, it may look a little different from one place to the next. Um, and I think in California, what we're going to do is going to look different than so cover crops are a big part of that, just as an example um, right. of the idea of regenerative. But a lot of times because of our diverse rotation, we actually don't have time enough, first of all, to to go plant another crop in the interim between crops. But then a lot of times we don't get enough rain um, that would make it successful. So yeah. it's it's a balance, um, but our compost project kind of region and climates and growing conditions and also the the varietals and you know, types of cotton too, right? ELS is gonna, you know, the barbenance is gonna feel a lot different than the Harrisudum, right? In terms of what they're gonna look for to grow and help on the yield side of things. Yep. Exactly. So speaking speaking of that, and we'll we'll I'll try to kind of keep pushing us through here. 
specifically why, you know, since, since we partner with you on, on the Sapima stuff, um, we're being partners with Sapima. Um, why do you grow Sapima or extra long staple? I definitely want to touch on this because I think Sapima does such a, what they have in terms of the traceability, it, you know, decades ahead of their time. And still, I don't see anyone else doing it, especially on the cotton side of things in order to, um, verify where uh, this specific cotton was moving through the supply chain. Um, just incredible stuff. So just hats off to Sapima. Um, but why is it that you grow Sapima specifically? I'm, I'm sure there's some reason or rationale behind it. Could be your family started with that cotton was a, you know something that your great grandfather grew and it's something you still like doing. So it could be an emotional thing all the way to it's you know from a rotation it helps. Yeah, I think the specifics are really just that um, extra long staple cotton essentially is what qualifies as a as a Supima cotton. And uh, Supima slightly changed the way they we used to pay a due to be a Supima grower. But now it's essentially flipped over to where the uh, where the uh, mills now pay the fee. Anyway, that's a little nuance. But um, so what we grow can be a Supima cotton. Uh, it doesn't now come off the farm as a Supima cotton. It becomes that once the mill accesses the fee. But extra long staple cotton, I, I think, in our uh, philosophy has really been because it because of the unique climate that I highlighted, where we have a long, uh, dry, warm summer climate. Um, we really are the unique place that uh, Pima cotton can be grown. Um, so California, because we have a lot of those prepackaged um, kind of regulations for protecting the environment and protecting humans, uh, our cost of production is often a little bit higher or quite a bit higher than other places. Um, so with really any crop that we grow, we're trying to grow the crop that is meant to grow in California because it, usually there's a premium associated with that. <laughs> and then obviously the, the there's a lot of upland cotton grown around the world, um, you know, millions and millions mm -hmm. of acres, but sure. uh, it's a sort short of a people, niche. It's, right. Yeah, it's a, it's a niche for us that uh, is, is, again, extracting that unique nature of California to produce the best, highest quality uh, fiber that we can. Super cool. Yeah, to bar none, you know, from the, not only were they, you know, decades ahead of the entire industry um, and still are, I don't know anyone else doing this to this level on the traceability component, but it also just happens to be the best extra long staple fiber on the planet right so it's just a kind of a, a double whammy there that um just hats off to them for you know blazing the trail on this this traceability component it really really ties back to ethical sourcing which i was just reading some stuff last night and kind of prepping for our call just getting more information on the stuff that's happening in brazil um in the southwest region where it's this just uh, land wars and big corporations coming in and growing soy and cotton and sending it to Europe. There's a major, major um, lawsuit happening all over Europe with a variety of huge brands like mall brands, major, major players, you know, getting stuff from this region. Um, obviously, we know the stuff happening in the Uyghur region in China. There's horrific conditions happening around state sponsored labor. Um, this stuff is also happening in small portions of India. Um, so, you know, the, the value and the importance I said in the very beginning, but the value and the importance of the traceability of where this cotton is coming from the origin side of things is just becoming more and more clear. You know, I think we probably think the general thinking is, um, Hey, we've, we've got past, um, a lot of the stuff that, um, we were facing, you know, in the last couple hundred years and the reality is we're, we're, we haven't moved that far. I mean, in the U S we certainly have, but, um, so again, traceability piece here, ethically sourced products, cotton, et cetera, just more and more clear every day that this is this is the path forward. This is the sustainable path forward. So on this, I'll, I'll hop into, from your perspective, I know you, got, you have a pretty active Twitter and you're also on the state water board. So you do some really cool stuff. So you're in the community. So um, I'm sure you get hit with lots of these questions, but what do you think are some of the most common myths or the misinformation that's out there surrounding farming and also specifically cotton farming? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I think on the on the cotton side, I just look at, you know, it's a it's a it's a fiber that's, you know, really unique. Ours that we grow is obviously even more unique than what's out there in the world. But, you know, cotton is a well-loved, you know, fabric and fiber, I think, that everybody has in their in their closets. And I think, you know, unfortunately, people don't understand, you know, the sourcing aspect. And, you know, to your point about traceability, you really can't have 
you know, true accountability without or sustainability without the traceability piece uh, to have that supply chain uh, visibility. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think there's there's cotton, very huge variations of how it's produced around the world. And, you know, certainly hope that people uh, become more interested in where they're they're sourcing their their cotton from and where the consumer is paying, you know, paying to access the the cotton and but you know I think around agriculture in California there's a lot of uh, questions about you know water use and and you know uh, how much um, you know just with any crop I think there's a lot of questions about uh, you know water use and what's the value and you know I think again there's uh, we all have to food food anything I grow takes water and so again California is unique because the drop of water that you add yields you much more than if you grew it somewhere else and the quality and the consistency. So those are things that are kind of a little bit of a nuance. I think everybody's used to having, you know, food and access to fiber, you know, just not even be something on the, on their minds. Um, you know, through COVID, I think people got nervous about, you know, toilet paper and some other food stuffs very briefly, but for the most part, we have pretty pretty good stability, but um, right. you know, I think, I think the questions around water use is, you know, water's an input for me that's expensive, um, you know, the, the raw water to me is not always that expensive because I'm not a, I'm not an urban area that needs to be treated like uh, for drinking. But once you add in all the, all the other parts of the infrastructure and the people who have to manage it and deliver it to our farm. And, you know, we have a water district that we're a part of. So water is a big cost to me. So that's why we've made uh, investments in over 80% of the farm having drip irrigation installed. So, uh, right now, that's the highest level of technology for water conservation. So we've made big investments in in using, uh, you know, that resource uh, wisely. Um, I think I did highlight that we are adjacent to a, a refuge area um, and actually have some corridors that run through the farm. Working with Audubon and others, we actually don't want all or, or it's not the best idea to put all of our water into drip irrigation where it's underground, because <clears throat> essentially that would then limit it to uh, only, you know, there's no access to the birds and the other creatures that are in our area. So actually having some water on the surface is is a benefit to the local environment. So while we don't have very much gravity flow irrigation anymore on the top of the surface of the land, um, we still have about 20% of the farm where we do, you know, put the water above the ground, but it's serving multiple benefits. So, um, you know, I think the myths are more around where people just haven't done uh, the next step of trying to investigate just a little bit further, you kind of hear the sound bites and you kind of stop. If you stop there, there's there's ways to get, you know, confused or, you know, again, it's like we don't want to generalize about people um, and about, you know, those kind of things. But we generalize. It seems like there's generalizations made about agriculture that people just could just do a little bit more investigating and find a little bit more truth. But, um, you know, cotton sure. that we, you know, anyway, we grow high value cotton and we're doing it with the the least amount of resources possible but we also need to keep in mind you know yield and quality is, is something we want to focus on as well yeah it makes sense i was chatting with um uh, another family farmer who's doing some regenerative ag stuff in west texas outside of lubbock two years ago we were looking at a project original favorites was and um he we were chatting about the same thing which is some misinformation or the perception uh, from the general public of what's happening at the cotton farmer at the farm level and i think he just said it very succinctly and it stuck with me, which was anytime you run a piece of equipment down the rows or you jump in the harvester or you apply any inputs. And so for the general public, that's um, pesticides, fertilizers, water, um, all this is a cost. And so, you know, if the perception is the farmers are just out there running down the rows, spraying all of these expensive, you know, spraying all the stuff onto the crops to make it grow and have this massive yield. All that stuff costs money. Running the machines, diesel's expensive. All this stuff, again, just as you framed very nicely, it's all like expensive stuff that goes as these inputs into to help balance out the cost versus what you're going to sell it for. So, and then on the, um, you know, you said you alluded to this earlier, your community and people helping you, helping you run the farm, if they're not healthy, you know, their hands are in the soil every day, you know, planting, obviously, you know, all through the stages of growth, the little hands in the farm. And if there's toxic stuff there, it's going to make everyone sick. So it's, again, the perception is just use chemicals to dump onto the farm and everything's going to be okay. In reality, that's, that's not what's happening. 
So especially in our in, in your region in our country, you know, that's not the case everywhere globally for sure, for sure. But you know, in our region, it's it's you know, some of the power of you know what you're getting from the Sapima cotton as well. And that's one of the reasons we've partnered with Sapima for seven or eight years. Okay, so to give you kind of the flip side of this, where do you see where do you think the cotton farming industry needs to progress and improve? So where would you be critical of our of our industry? Yeah, I think it's been unfortunate over the years that people have sort of driven to the lowest cost. You know, I think that's been uh, unfortunate that the consumer sort of been educated that if you have, you know, $52 t-shirts, that's a good thing versus, you know, having like a five, $10 t-shirts, you know, so it'd be, it's those kind of things that um, I think, unfortunately, there's been that constant drive to, <clears throat> to lower cost. And, you know, on the brand side, I think, you know, there's been some pretty good margins extracted over time and it's harder to want to give some of those up for better cotton programs. But, um, you know, I think as, as the, as the focus on supply chains becomes increasingly uh, strong and people have to account, I think the European Union is leading the way on uh, making the accounting for the components of your supply chain a little bit more clear. Um, you know, I'm hopeful that that there can be more of that understanding of, of where things are coming from and rewarding the folks who are doing, um, you know, the right thing. And, you know, I don't think a consumer has to pay, you know, a whole lot more for things, um, but maybe just that mindset shift. But it is hard uh, to construct, uh, you know, projects sometimes when the focus for so long has been, if I can buy it, you know, for five cents cheaper, I'm going to go to that supplier versus, you know, really understanding if, you know, you maybe spent the extra five cents a pound or whatever the metric is that um, you actually could be coming off with something that was much better and had a much, you know, stronger story and more integrity. And so, um, you know, I think it's incumbent on, uh, you know, not just the farms to continue to do the right thing, but hopefully the brands and the partners within the supply chains to find ways to highlight, you know, that there can be better cotton uh, products coming out, um, you know, more responsibly produced and sourced and give the consumer something good to feel about um, versus I think there's been a lot, of, a lot of negative externalities created by the drive to the bottom, you know, collapsing factories in Bangladesh, slavery in uh, certain countries, child labor, deforestation, excessive chemical, you know, the cotton industry is, uh, is, is littered with uh, examples of uh, bad behavior trying to cut you know, costs or, or not do the right thing. And so, um, you know, I'm hopeful that people will, will embrace a, a better story and that uh, the people who provide that story will find ways to be rewarded for the good things that are happening. Couldn't agree more. There's not much else to be said about it right there. I mean, it just really sums it up. Again, you know, let's just call it out. Original Favorites is a business and we want to grow our business. However, at the core of what we do is is this is this piece, which you just mentioned, which is cheap is unsustainable, period. It, it doesn't last, you know, if, if to, to have a $2 t-shirt, uh, you know, it's a tri-blend, it is 100% plastic. It's gonna pill the second time you wash it. And then that garment's basically done. You know, in our industry, we do, we work with a lot of promo and decorators and um, at specialty folks. And the industry literally has this thing called a throwaway t-shirt, which is you go to a trade show and someone's, you know, doing a t-shirt cannon and shooting t-shirts to people, literally this tri-blend t-shirt that is made from plastic um, or heavy blend plastic with cotton, it's just going to get thrown away. So, you know, we, we, yes, we make brand new clothes and we try to sell them, but if our product life cycle has 5X on a t-shirt, you know, we think um, hard to quantify and hard to put in stats and communicate to all of our customers, but that is inherently by nature more sustainable than something that is going to be cheap and break down. Um, yeah, so, and I think, and this is one of the huge reasons why we wanted to do this. If we can help educate folks and then they are educating people in their circle as well, that cheap, what really happens is it's hurting the farm and it's hurting the people growing these products that it starts to, it takes on a different form and a different shape. And um, hopefully, we get to use our buying power and what we're doing with our decisions surrounding buying with our, you know, with our dollars has power and, and where we kind of forcing the hand on these bad actors that if we don't continue to participate, just like this Brazil thing, it's just starting to catch more light. Um, if you're not buying cotton from those areas or the Uyghur region of China, that, that in essence kind of snuffs out what's happening or at least diminishes their ability to make money 
continue to exploit, continue to deforest at the rates at which they're doing. So obviously these are massive, huge global problems and, you know, countries and massive corporations and, you know, we're, we're small and we, it's going to be tough to have major, major impact on this stuff, but it, we, we, I think we should. And I think it takes, you know, the community to do so. Um, so I'll get off my ideologies and, you know, stuff that, <clears throat> that I'm passionate about and kind of just try to wrap it up here on, um, you know, just some, we, we just kind of chatted about it, but this, my last question is my, my guess is you're, you're facing as an independently owned farm, especially in, you know, looking at what's happening on, um, large corporations buying farms and family farms, acquiring them at a rapid rate all over the world, but also in the U.S. What, what are some of the unique challenges that you're facing currently and kind of what the next maybe few decades look like for, for you and the Bulls farm? Yeah, it's a great question and things I think about, but certainly, um, you know, continuing to be able to pass the farm along is something that, you know, is becoming increasingly uh, challenging. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not so old yet. I still have a few years left, but, um, you know, encouraging uh, younger parts of our family to want to come into this business is not doesn't look like it's going to be that easy. So I'm certainly concerned that, um, you know, at some point we either have to bring in an outside non-family member to be the first time that we've um, I just have a friend whose business they just transitioned from a family CEO to a uh, outsider. And so um, I think we're seeing more of that. And then, you know, there's been a lot of private equity money that's come in and changed the face of, um, you know, California agriculture. And so we're doing the best that we can. Um, and, you know, I'm focused again on growing uh, the best products we can grow and doing it in a sustainable way. But um, I think, you know, if the consumer is always going to just go to the cheapest thing or not ever worry about, you know, California is a great state and, you know, we've had a very progressive legislature. Um, you know, I've got a great uh, document that I made that kind of highlights, especially just cotton growing regions versus our region, even the United States cotton growing regions, you know, we're paying the highest minimum wage, we're paying overtime. Um, you know, we've have heat stress regulations, paid family leave, uh, you know, workplace violence uh, plans, injury illness prevention programs. I mean, we have, we have a litany of things that are that are different than than anywhere else producing cotton. Um, yeah, but again, you guys have taken some additional steps too for your workers and employees, right? Some additional benefits that you guys chose to absolutely. not just California's the most regulated state for all of this and the most regulated country, but you guys have taken an additional big step up. I remember hearing absolutely, yeah. No, we've, we've made uh, we've got a great. Uh, uh, be bulls farming uh, scholars program that we do every year where we're buying the school supplies for all the kids and grandkids of our workers. So they're able to start mm -hmm. the school year with a new backpack and, you know, new things to make them feel excited about school. Um, and then we've got a scholarship program where we're devoting a lot of resources to um, the educational journeys of, of the uh, of the kids of our of our employees and great examples of kids are going on to get their PhDs managing, you know, big retail chains in the valley and kids who've grown up right here on the farm and parents work for us for many years. And so, um, you know, that transformational journey we're helping to support is really, really rewarding. So, you know, we're going to continue to just do the right things for the for the people and in, in the environment around us. But, um, you know, we need. We need some recognition, you know, hopefully at some point that the consumer wants to, you know, again, reward those who are doing the right thing. And so I think, um, you know, but again, it's, we're not doing it for recognition. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave out the incredible stuff. That's just got to commend you at all levels. Um, just hard stop. Just really cool to hear this whole story. Um, we, we are, and I'll leave out some of the details. We are seeing some really good trends on the Supima stuff. Uh, on our side with our customers and quite a bit of attention. Um, so we're hopeful too. And uh, I think that's what we all need is a little hope in the world. And um, yeah, so we will turn it over to anyone that has a question. This could be our team, Pete, my business partner. If you want to hop in, I'm sure I missed a bunch yeah. of stuff um, or anyone in the comment section, we're going to be turning it over to the comment area as well for anyone that would like to hop in and ask Canon questions and hit them with the tough stuff too. Anything, nothing's off limits here. This is, you know, there's open some, form. Yeah, there's some good stuff in here. This is Pete, by the way, Dave's partner. Dave, that was great. Canon, thanks so much for your time. What a, what a great insight into incredible uh, and almost prehistoric industry in this country. You know, in the country's history, farming is a huge part of it. And to hear about your family and how long they've been doing it is just incredible. Um, there's some good questions in here too. And stuff that probably would be a combination of both you know, what we would have answers on and can and you as well. 
the first one in here I saw was um, was asking about the difference between organic cotton and supima cotton, and that's a that's a good question because they're actually two very different things. Organic is is the way in which you grow the cotton, right? It's it's is it is it an organic uh, uh, agricultural approach, and then supima is the type of cotton. Just like if you go to like a grocery store and you buy tomatoes, you could buy like cherry tomatoes or Roma tomatoes. And then you go to this other section and they have heirloom tomatoes, which have like the kind of cool colors on them and not heirloom, like how Bellingham is sort of spells it differently to from a marketing standpoint, like A I R L U M E, but actually heirloom H E I R L O O M. And that's a different type of seed, different type of plant that has completely different properties in standard short staple cotton. And the reason why it's 1% of the cotton grown globally or less than is because it's hard to grow and it's expensive, like Cannon talked about. And most consumers don't want to pay for better. They want everything to be delivered the way they currently get it delivered um, from a price standpoint, but they want it to be all of these other things that, that aren't necessarily maybe willing to pay for. Um, but organic is also a great question and it's something we didn't get a chance to dive into, but I encourage all of you out there to do research on it because you can grow cotton organically, and a lot of people do, um, and then make your T-shirt and saturate it in formaldehyde and harmful toxic dyes, which is how most of the organic T-shirts out there are made. So you've taken this organic cotton. This is like, great. We prized it. We'll take it. And then we're going to spin it into yarn, cut it and sew it into a T-shirt, and then we're going to dump it in some sort of vat of some wash to make it softer make it look cool and you basically just completely saturated in toxins. So this is why Dave mentioned third parties. I encourage all of you to, to research. There are a few very credible third parties out there. Like we use GOTS, which is the global organic textile standard. And they come in and they go, is this product organic? Well, yeah, we're using organic cotton on like all of our sweatshirts, for example. But beyond that, how is the fabric processed? How is it dyed? Is it an Okatex 100 certified dye? which means it doesn't have any of the toxins in there. Um, and it goes through the entire process from start to finish, not just the harvesting and the farming part of it, because that's part of it, but it's part of it. And I think that's really important to note. Supima as a, as a crop is actually really hard to grow organically. I and mean, they can and could probably speak to this. It's not done very often because there is a natural uh, pest out there and, and it does attack the, the crop pretty aggressively if it's not treated. He mentioned in California, they use some stuff that uh, is now outlawed that they can't use anymore, but it's allowed pretty much everywhere else in the world. And that's because that's the most regulated state in the most regulated country. So our approach with Supima is that while it maybe isn't certified organic, um, all of the steps that we do throughout the process, in addition to the fact that the product itself is significantly more sustainable, because not only is it, we know within a few yards of where it was grown because of the molecular tracing component through orotin, but also the fact that it's gonna last for a long, long time, instead of ending up in a landfill, or then we try to recycle it and blend it with a bunch of other stuff to do some sort of greenwashing technique. So it's a long way around the answer, but organic is the process, Supima is the type of cotton. And I hope that sort of helps answer some of that. And Cannon, go ahead and feel free to correct me in any of the stuff. Yeah, I think it's important also to rec recognize, I mean, Supima doesn't necessarily license any specific variety of cotton other than it has to be a cotton that's classed as an extra long staple. Um, so again, the USDA classes all the cotton in the United States as it comes out of the cotton gins. Um, so right now, the way it used to be was we would pay a fee and be a Supima grower. It's flipped a little bit, like I said earlier, where the mills now pay those fees. But so there's a there are Pimas that can go out into the world from California that if the mill doesn't pay the fee, it isn't necessarily called Supima. Um, so it, it's that's a Pima, little bit. Right? Pima has been the kind of the marketing arm and has been a great has done a great job of, of, of amplifying the message about, about the cotton and the value. Um, so just that's just a slight nuance. So not really a variety, but the types nested under the extra long staple umbrella. But to the organic question, you know, we've had a very successful organic program, uh, but it was very much uh, uh, hinges upon a, a specific buyer who recognized the value of us being able to produce a very high quality organic uh, certified, and they wanted to make sure that they felt comfortable because there's a lot of organic that comes from places that maybe is organic cotton or maybe is not. Um, and I just would highlight culturally, like there's areas of the world where it isn't looked down upon to facilitate things happening. So by facilitate, I mean, 
you know, you can get stopped at a traffic stop, maybe south of the border. You can be on your way in five minutes sometimes, or you can maybe have be taken down to the station, but a little bit of facilitation will get you on your way faster. So that's not really looked down upon in, in other areas, but it's certainly not something that if I, if I have a food safety audit, the last thing in my mind would be that I'm going to slip somebody something to make it go faster. Um, it just doesn't enter into our consciousness. But again, so I guess sometimes relying just even on the organic certification is something that's, I think, challenging. There's probably way more organic in the world that isn't really organic. Uh, so, But also just from a farming standpoint, there's actually some things that happen in organic cotton production specifically that are not as environmentally friendly as sometimes when we do a, a conventional cotton, which again, we're running tractors a lot more because we're having to mechanically control uh, weeds. So there's a lot more passes. And then on the pest side, we have very non-selective things that we do like oils and things that we put on the organic because just because it's organic doesn't mean that we don't treat. Um, so we do treat, but the treatments aren't necessarily um, as specific as what we can do in conventional. There's some very expensive conventional chemistries that just paralyze the mouth parts of some of our predatory cotton bugs, um, but they don't hurt the beneficial insects. Um, so we use those on the conventional side, but on the organic side, we're forced to kind of blanket cover where it, it, it does knock down the bad insects, but it also knocks down our good insects. So there's pros and cons with all these methodologies. Um, and I think, you know, again, we have an or successful organic program on tomatoes and cotton, and we enjoy uh, the benefits of that. But I don't necessarily think it's like the answer to, to everything. I think it's, you know, it's, it's more complicated. Um, sure. But and to your point, uh, Pete, you know, you said a lot of things can happen after it leaves the farm that also are, you know, negative kind of externalities. So um, it's it's just that complexity of this whole thing. And uh, but again, if you have a clear handshake with good partners through your supply chain, I think you can, again, translate a much better, uh, much better story. And, and I was going to there's another question. Here. I was going to follow up on that from a, from a customer. Dave, sorry, I didn't mean it. No worries. Let me, let me just pop in one thing, because I think this is such a good point. It's part of the reason why we had want to have this continuing edu education series focused on this exactly is that the consumer, and it's fair, they want something simple. They want, it's organic and that is the box that needs to be checked in order for them to feel good about the purchase of the product. And in reality, what we're hearing directly from Canon, who does both conventional and organic farming and regenerative ag programs, that it, it's not one solution is the perfect one for, for every product or every crop. And that sometimes the organic piece to this could actually mean that they're putting out more CO2, given that you have to run your machines down the rows at a higher a higher rate than if you're just doing the conventional Supima. Correct. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great point. And, and there, there's some questions in here about water usage, which I think this is going to be great for Canon to talk about. Um, but basically kind of saying, and then this is my, my two cents on this too, is like the cheeseburger. I've seen a post the other day. It was like a cheeseburger is... 17,000 gallons of water because the cow's got to have so much water to, and it's like, well, when we get into these kind of things, these are, these are like memes at this level almost. I mean, we're talking about misinformation given on a level that's like incomprehensible because we could take any aspect of our daily lives and find something about it that's wildly outside the spectrum of what it could or should be with regards to usage or anything along those lines. But that being said, there's some questions here about um, flax and hemp compared to cotton and the water thirst of it and that kind of stuff. Can you speak a little bit more about the water usage in cotton? Maybe things that yeah. are, that could be better and then also things that maybe are misrepresented in sort of the way that they're told. Yeah, I think what's interesting is as we've gone to more drip irrigation, it really takes like, I mean, about 2.3 to 2.5 acre feet. And I'm sorry, I'm going to get into, once you start talking water, I think everybody's eyes are going to glaze over, but <laughs> it takes it takes about 2.3 to 2.5 acre feet to grow a crop of cotton. But again, I'm producing like four bales of cotton per acre with that water where, you know, a cotton plant growing in other regions might produce only like 800 pounds or a thousand pounds. So it's like massive amounts of yield. And, but again, that 2.3 to 2.5 acre feet, that's gonna be about the same for growing tomatoes. Um, once you use the drip, it's really just the consumptive use of that plant that's right above that drip tape, what it's taking in, and we're just feeding it just that amount that it needs just for that production. Uh, so it, it really like, I can't, I can't apply like more water than that necessarily, because that's exactly what the plant needs. And that's just kind of a general rule as we've seen over time. So we've reduced, you know, from 
applying with gravity flow, what we used to do, you know, we have cut down on the amount of applied water. Um, so again, maybe going from like three and a half acre feet or four in some instances down to that 2.3, 2.5. So we've made huge reductions, but we've also been able to maintain productivity. So, but again, like if I'm making a decision to grow cotton, I mean, I'm sort of balancing that against tomatoes and, and other things that are essentially going to take just about the same amount of water using that drip irrigation technology. And again, cotton is something that we can irrigate above ground with, with the flood irrigation. I'll say when we do use the gravity irrigation, the fields have been leveled with a GPS system that is within a sub inch accuracy to make sure that the fall, so the water sheets like perfectly across, and we spend a lot of money to make sure that that happens. So not only is the water sheeting across efficiently, even in what we call flood irrigation, but it's also then doing some of what I talked about, which is giving water access above ground to a lot of the birds and animal species in our area, and also helping with groundwater recharge. So there's, it's again, it's like the nuances of, of all this stuff is where we get, you know, if you just want to generalize and say like, oh, that's too much water and whatever. And I don't, unfortunately, I I don't have the metrics on hemp and flax and some of those things, but um, you know, in uh, in our setting where we're you know carefully balancing rotation with food and fiber, you know, we find cotton to be a valuable rotation crop for us, and it's not using some astronomical amount of water more than any of really the other things that we're growing with the water saving technology that we're using. Yeah, th these are our choices. We 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 selected as humans cotton over flax once you know this was just in the last 100 years a little over 100 years that these were choices we've made right flax if let's say it's a more efficient plant but we have selected as a cotton feels better on the skin you know so these are our choices as human beings um, and I thought Pete you, you brought up such a good point I just can't resist to, to dive into this because I think this is some of the mindset we're trying to help reframe is how bad cheap is, right? How bad it is for the environment and how bad it is for the people throughout the sub supply chain creating this product and that we're just driving, driving cheap, right? So, um, but another piece to this too is, you know, I think textiles get a lot of scrutiny. They get, we get picked on quite a bit as an industry and it's, and it's fair, we should be doing it. We need to do all this stuff. I, I, we, this is why we, our entire philosophy and ethos behind the company is this traceability and really high quality products. So we, you know, this is at the core of our company DNA and what we're passionate about as individuals. But our industry gets picked on quite a bit as, you know, from a textile perspective. And it's just, it's just hyper convenient that the consumer gets to pick, they get to conveniently pick what they're gonna scrutinize in terms of what they're purchasing and what that product and how it impacts the environment or carbon emissions or the people that are making these products, let's let's use the the big elf in the room, which is lithium and cobalt. So for your iPhone, do you know where your lithium was mined? That the iPhone you have in your hand, you probably don't. For any processor you've had, a, that for anything that you have in your life that needs a chip, cobalt. Where was that cobalt mined? It was probably hand mined, which is some of the most atrocious working conditions on the planet. These hand mines, which they call artisanal, which is just the most egregious, you know, wrapping of, you know, they're digging it by hand and picks and hands and stuff. And uh, yeah, so I just think if we, we have to attack the same thing, right, which is if we're going to look at all the stuff, if we're going to criticize one area like t-shirts and if it's not organic, I'm not buying it, you know, then let's also look at the other things that we're doing as humans and the products we're making and, and purchasing. And let's look at the whole picture because it's, it's the ecosystem is, you know, it's not just these one dimensions and these one pieces. So I wanted to point out just quickly, just because I saw a question in the chats there. Um, another thing to consider is that, you know, for for us, like, first of all, with the crops we grow, there's there's like a knowledge uh, amount that like we know how to grow cotton really well. It's like it's part of our DNA to be a good cotton grower. But we've also made significant investments in like the machinery that's needed to do that process. So one cotton harvester costs over a million dollars and it only works one month out of the year. So we have made investments. So those those assets are sitting there waiting for cotton to be harvested. So I can't really in, in good judgment just say like, oh, we're going to stop growing cotton this year and we're going to do something else. And we also made investments upstream in a cotton gin. So we have like a kind of vertical into this up, you know, adding value by taking, you know, cleaning the cotton to go to the mill. 
So again, not that we're locked in because our number of cotton acres goes up and down over the years, but we are sort of need to stay within our confines of the, you know, the crops that we know how okay. to grow efficiently and those kinds. Of, so I think that's another aspect of, you know, you can't just jump around and I can't just suddenly say like next year, I'm going to be a hemp grower or a flax grower, or, you know, mm -hmm. some of those, some of those, the knowledge and the, and those things are really valuable that we've developed over time. And we have taken on a lot of new crops over the last few years and that has been painful. Like there was times when I started growing carrots and garlic and onions, things that had never been grown in our area. And, you know, we lost money uh, the first couple of years. Now we're doing really well and we've learned it, but you also have to keep a lens in agriculture. You can't really make super quick shifts, you know? And so again, that's part of the mm -hmm. danger of like saying like, well, farmers should just do that or farmers should just do this. I right. mean, we've been iterating on our systems for years and years and years, but it's in a business where we're exposed to weather risks, pest risks, you know, all these things that are out of our control, price risk, you know, we can't suddenly say like, oh, I'm going to just throw out all that knowledge that I've had for the, like learning how to do that crop for the last 20 years. And now I'm going to try something totally different, or I'm going to like change like a fundamental component of how I farm. It just exposes this huge. And we've seen that in some of these um, smaller region projects that we've done. We've actually had PhDs come in from some of the Midwest and say like, oh, you need to do this kind of system. And it's like failed in the same field, we've let them do their system versus our system and, you know, getting like less than a bale of cotton off of their system to four bales on our system right next door. You know, so it's like, wow. those are the things that we have to be really wow. careful because we've got a lot riding on every crop. Sure. There's a lot of risk. And like, we come through years where we've lost a lot of money as we've made, you know, changes and tried to like, try to get to the next level with different crops. It's really hard. So it's, it's just not something you can just flip switches and jump around and you do have those infrastructure right. investments too. Makes total sense. And and to be conscious of everybody else's time out there too, um, I was going to mention a couple of things, Dave, and then if there's anything else you want to cover on this, we, we can probably wrap it up in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Good. But I was going to say, this is funny. We, what we haven't mentioned yet is that we met Cannon at like the farm. Like we, Dave and I go up to the Supima Harvest and we meet the farmers. We know the farmers. And so this conversation started a couple of years ago when we were there, or like a year and a half ago, I think, when we were at the harvest. And we, we have these conversations with these farmers that grow the cotton that we use. And that process is, is really cool. Like for us, for Dave and I to be in these fields in the pictures, like we're out there walking around um, is, is neat. It was part of this process where years ago when we started original favorites, it was like, we want to dig all the way in the supply chain. And we started to like dive into it and like where we're getting our cotton from and like, how is it grown and what type of cotton is it? And then what are the processes here? How do we dye things? The more we dug, the more we realized we don't know anything like this got like kind of scary. It was like the biggest iceberg imaginable. And to, so, so for us to take things at people's word became difficult because you'd start to see how easy it is to misrepresent the farming practices, the manufacturing practices, the transportation practices, all of it is simply like a stamp on a piece of paper or someone telling you something. And so when next level got busted for this whole Western China, Uyghur region cotton thing last year, and it was all over the news that they were using this slave labor cotton, I don't necessarily felt feel like it was necessarily the people at the top that were like trying to go take these people and put them into slave camps and we're going to get the cotton cheap. It was just not asking enough or digging enough at all these different levels. And a lot of times it's pretty opaque. It's hard to get down into the detail because they don't let you unless you really start to ma like, like mandate it. Like we need these answers. And if someone's going to give you something really inexpensively, it's very easy to take it and say, well, look, at we got extra margin here. This is great. But if you don't really have the proof behind it from a third party, you start to realize how much you don't know. And as much as we dug is the more we started to realize we didn't know. And that's why now you're six or seven into this thing and we're getting deeper and deeper. And we're already having conversations with our farmers who we've known for years and we still find out new stuff. So it just goes to show that these sort of things require all of us, including the consumers, to ask tough questions and demand proof. Because that's when all of this sort of, sort of language just shit hits the fan for the bad actors. And that's, I think, an important thing for us to do. So, end of my diatribe. <laughs> that was good. Ken, this was great. We're yeah, thank you guys. to host this. Um, we are going to send this out in video and um, we'll send it over to you. If anyone else has questions on in the chat, you can always just email us, customer service at Original Favorites. We're here to talk. We're here to learn. We're here to get better. Um, that's it. That's the end of it. Thank you so much, Canon. This was phenomenal. Yeah, I appreciate you guys and your approach. You know, it's great to make the connections and I think it's really healthy and 
You guys are welcome on the farm anytime. It's a lot of, awesome. a lot of fun we'll, stuff. We're going to take you up on it soon. Great. Thanks again. Thanks everyone for Thank joining. You guys. Have a great day. Okay, you too. All right. Bye-bye.